Since it won its independence from Spain in 1825 and until the return of civilian rule in 1982, the landlocked South American country of Bolivia earned the dubious distinction of having the highest number of coup d'etats in world history. In those 157 years, there were about 188 coups, more than one per year. Yet, four years ago, Bolivia succeeded in something remarkable, an accomplishment that was uncharacteristic of its own past and also incredibly rare in the history of Latin America. In October 2020, Bolivia reversed a US-backed coup and managed to restore its democracy. Here's the short version of what took place. On November 11th, 2019, far-right vigilantes backed by the military, the police, and the United States under President Trump forced the democratically elected President Evo Morales out of office. Although Morales had just won re-election a month before, with baseless claims of electoral irregularities, the right wing mobilized and used street violence to force President Morales out of office. But after a year-long resistance movement from the left, the far-right interim government that took power was pressured to call for new elections in October 2020. And as a result, Morales' political party, the Movement Towards Socialism, or MAS, swept back into power with Luis Arce as their new democratically elected president. Evo Morales has claimed that the US orchestrated the coup d'etat to tap into Bolivia's reserves of lithium. While the extent of U.S. involvement still requires further investigation, there is no question that the Trump administration, members of the U.S. Senate, as well as American business elites, encouraged the overthrow of Morales. The U.S.-based National Endowment for Democracy spent millions in Bolivia between 2016 and 2019 almost exclusively to fund opposition groups. The billionaire Elon Musk, who wants the country's reserves of lithium, openly admitted that we will coup whoever we want deal with it. In November 2019, 16 audio recordings of the coup leaders were leaked. The recordings revealed that they had been in close contact with the US Senators Ted Cruz, Marco Rubio, and Bob Menendez. Furthermore, it was the Organization of American States, which gets 60% of their funding from the US, that made the later debunked claim about quote-unquote electoral irregularities during the 2019 Bolivian election, which gave the Bolivian far-right political ammunition to overthrow Morales. After the coup, President Trump issued a statement applauding the Bolivian military for Morales' ousting. And even when democracy was restored after the October 2020 election, Morales' successor Luis Arce faced a challenge from the former defense minister during the coup, who, according to The Intercept, plotted to bring in US mercenaries in order to cling to power. So how did a country with a long history of coups manage this time to thwart the efforts of the great American empire? There is no single explanation as how and why Bolivia managed to overturn the coup d'etat in 2020. And for those who want to learn more about the nuances of what happened in Bolivia in those turbulent few years, I highly recommend the book Coup, A Story of Violence and Resistance in Bolivia by Linda Farthing and Thomas Becker. But there is one crucial reason why the country succeeded in maintaining their democracy. Ever since Evo Morales came to power in 2006, Bolivia has been unique among countries of the world in possessing a robust safeguard against a potential authoritarian takeover. What I call bottom-up democracy. Unlike Western liberal democracies such as the United States, where there are only two major political parties controlled by big corporate donors, Bolivia is an exception where grassroots, collective, social movements are the main drivers of establishing the agenda of its biggest party, the Movement Towards Socialism (MAS). In the United States, political participation for most people simply means voting in periodic elections. But in Bolivia, political participation among the masses goes beyond the ballot box, giving the working class and ordinary people more of a say in setting public policy. And they do this through constant organizing and public demonstrations. And thanks to this system of bottom-up democratic participation during the years of Evo Morales' administration, the Bolivian left was well ready and organized to overturn the 2019 coup. They had decades of what we can call quote-unquote practice of constant activism. So by 2019 and 2020, veteran organizers were able to mount a robust resistance movement against which the right-wing leaders of the coup were left helpless. To understand this phenomenon of bottom-up democracy, let's go back to when Evo Morales first became president. In 2005, Evo Morales won his presidential election with 54% of the vote by running on the Movement Towards Socialism MAS ticket. 
It was the first time since Bolivia returned to civilian rule that a presidential candidate had won with an absolute majority. Morales was a former prisoner and dissident and was once so poor that he had to collect orange and banana peels from the street to feed himself. And in a country where almost two thirds of the population identifies themselves as indigenous, Morales made history as the first elective Native American head of state in the Western Hemisphere. To put this in perspective, imagine if the United States elected a president who had been incarcerated multiple times for anti-government activities, or if the nation voted for a former street beggar into the White House, it would be considered inconceivable. Despite the lip service paid to the quote unquote American dream and rising up from humble origins, five of the last six US presidents have all attended Ivy League schools. Many enjoyed close relations with Wall Street and some of the richest people in the world. Today in the US, it is impossible possible to imagine anyone without an elite background becoming the nominee for either of the two major parties. And yet, the Bolivian left accomplished what would be unheard of in the United States by electing a poor peasant to the highest office of the land. But bottom-up democracy goes beyond the existence of a political environment in which a member of the poorest class can become head of state. It encompasses important principles and practices that ensures that the voices of the masses are heard and heeded by the elected leaders. Before he was elected president, Evo Morales had been an organizer. In the year 2000, during what was called the Water War, the right-wing government attempted to enact a neoliberal policy of privatizing the water in the city of Cochabamba, as well as increasing prices for the access to that water. Morales, along with other indigenous leaders of the MAS, founded just a few years earlier, succeeded in mobilizing a popular movement to reverse the draconian policy through massive demonstrations and civil disobedience. The participation in the MAS in these demonstrations needs to be underscored, for here again, we find an important difference between politics in Bolivia and politics in countries like in the US. As UC San Diego professor Nancy Pastero points out in her book, The Indigenous State, Race, Politics, and Performance in Plural National Bolivia, the MAS is not a traditional party, but the political instrument of the social movements that forms its base. Through activities that go beyond electoral politics, the MAS has managed to capture a wide base of campesinos, the landless movement, leftist lawyers, women's groups, some lowland indigenous leaders, and assorted Trotskyists. To appreciate the uniqueness of the MAS, one would have to imagine the Democratic Party in the US directly organizing civil disobedience, erecting barricades, and sending out its members to be arrested in political crusades like in the Occupy Wall Street movement. Certainly, there were many rank and file registered Democrats and interest groups, such as unions, who backed Occupy. But the Democratic Party apparatus itself would never formally engage in law breaking, especially against the financial sector that makes a large proportion of their donor base. By abstaining from direct action, the Dems perpetuate the American idea that democracy is confined to the realm of electoral politics and nothing else. The MAS in Bolivia, on the other hand, shows us democracy in the trenches, so to speak. This is why the MAS in Bolivia is unlike anything we have ever seen in recent memory in the US. It's a party that understands that elections are just one means of political participation. As renowned scholar Noam Chomsky has written about Bolivia, voters choose someone from their own ranks, not a representative of narrow sectors of privilege. There was real participation, extending over the years of intense struggle and organization. Election day was not just a brief interlude for pushing a lever and then retreating to passivity and private concern but one phase of an ongoing participation in the workings of a society. By these democratic mechanisms that go beyond electoral politics, Evo Morales' movement towards socialism party has accomplished way more for its people than the Democratic Party in the United States ever did for its constituents. With the backing and constant input of social movements, Morales' greatest achievement during his tenure as president was the dramatic reduction of poverty through both a large increase of the minimum wage and the introduction of a conditional cash transfer program to the poorest citizens. From 2006 to 2017, extreme poverty in Bolivia dropped from 38 to 15 percent, while overall poverty plummeted from 61 to 35 percent. Before Morales took power, the Gini coefficient score rated Bolivia as the second most economically unequal country in all of South America. By 2018, it became the fifth most equal country out of the 18 countries on the continent. Meanwhile, Bolivia's GDP per capita grew faster under Evo Morales than during any other period in the three and a half decades before his presidency. Under Morales, Bolivia had become Latin America's fastest growing economy.
Just think of what kind of approval rating the Democratic Party in the US would have if it managed to cut poverty in half while dramatically growing the economy at the same time. They would probably win every presidential election just as the MAS has done since 2005. Meanwhile, back in the US, the Democrats have struggled so long to pass a $15 minimum wage that the proposed increase would no longer be a living wage due to the recent inflation crisis. They cannot even get paid maternity leave, a public policy that Bolivians already enjoy. So why was Bolivia able to dramatically reduce poverty while economic inequality continues to grow in the United States? As I have mentioned, Bolivia has a bottom-up democracy where collective decisions are made through the demands of social movements rather than by the whims of wealthy corporate donors. It must be noted, therefore, that Bolivia didn't manage to cut poverty in half purely because of the benevolent instincts of its leader Evo Morales. Rather, these progressive changes often occurred in response to persistent pressures from left-wing popular movements, which, despite having one of their own in power, never became complacent and continued to press their own government for further demands. Morales' own former vice minister of the interior, Rafael Porente, put it best when he said, Make no mistake. It's not a government or an individual that transforms the country, but the people organized into movements that accomplish change. Or as Evo Morales himself told his supporters when he was first inaugurated as president, Control me. If I can't advance, push me, brothers and sisters. Correct me constantly, because I may err. And there were certainly times when Morales' own supporters and voters did, in fact, correct him. For instance, in 2010, a massive protest movement erupted in Southern Potosi over the government's failure to create jobs and invest in infrastructure. While the city went 80% for Morales' political party in the 2009 elections, over 60% of the population came out to occupy the city streets until the government capitulated to their demands. This is significant. It tells us that many of those who voted for Morales were willing to take to the streets to pressure the very government they had elected. The blind loyalty or cult of personality that we are beginning to see in places like the US did not exist for Morales. Another example comes from 2012, after Morales cut fuel subsidies. In response to subsequent rise in prices, protest movements emerged from the left. As Harvard professor Santiago Anria, author of when movements become parties, the Bolivian MAS in comparative perspective points out the conservative right did not lead the protest against cuts to fuel subsidies. Instead, mobilizations were led by sectors that had been traditional bastions of MAS support, and they demanded that Morales either annul the decree or resign. As a result of these massive demonstrations, President Morales was forced to apologize and reverse the measure. What was particularly telling about Morales' apology was his reference to a particular principle. He said he was trying to rule by obeying. The expression, ruling by obeying, is a popular slogan that originates from the ongoing indigenous anarchist Zapatista movement in Mexico. According to social scientist Shannon Speed, ruling by obeying can be described as downplaying the role of the leaders themselves and highlighting collective decision making and the subjection of individual leaders' power to the collective will. By citing this principle in his apology, Morales was acknowledging the popular expectation shared by the bulk of his base with their indigenous brothers and sisters in Mexico, that presidents must lead in a similar, collective way. As Forrest Halton and Sinclair Thomas, authors of Revolutionary Horizons, past and present in Bolivian politics, stated, The Bolivian left takes anarchist positions just like the Zapatistas. The Bolivian left is skeptical of concentrated political authority in the state and stresses the dynamism of communal democracy and local regional collective action. The importance of this principle, ruling by obeying, and remaining skeptical of concentrated power, helps explain why these movements avoid the pitfalls of being disorganized and passive. And it was exactly through the vigilance of these popular movements that Bolivians were eventually able to defend Morales' political project and overturn the right-wing coup. Democracy was restored in Bolivia in 2020 not because of any unbending loyalty to either a political party or individual, but through the tested and unwavering energy of its citizens who continued to organize and mobilize throughout the years of an administration they had brought into power. In keeping their eyes on the goal of building a socialist Bolivia, they never became apathetic or weak, and they were well ready to fight the eventual right-wing takeover. It must be stressed, however, that Bolivia's bottom-up democracy still remains in a fragile state. 
due to sharp ideological divides between the upper class whites and the working class indigenous groups. It is still a polarized country where the business elites would be more than happy to install an authoritarian dictatorship. On June 26, 2024, for instance, there was another coup attempt in Bolivia. A general named Juan Jose Zuinga tried to occupy the capital and kidnap the president. But the coup only lasted a day, with the people quickly mobilizing in defense of their president Luis Arce, and Zuinga was eventually arrested. But even if Bolivia's democracy is always in a constant threat from the far right, as well as from American business elites, that does not mean their system is more flawed than ours. On the contrary, just compare Bolivia's satisfaction with democracy to the United States. While 43% of Bolivians in the BTI Transformation Index poll said they were satisfied with their country's democracy, in the United States, only 28% responded in the Gallup poll expressing satisfaction with their democracy. Meanwhile, in Europe as well, a majority of voters surveyed in France and Hungary said they no longer think they even live in a democracy. So while Bolivians are not totally satisfied with their bottom-up democracy, the reason why it at least scores much higher than other countries in the West is due to other mechanisms to participate in the process beyond elections. It is an important lesson for those living in the US who are deeply concerned about the potential authoritarian takeover from another Trump administration. Think how well prepared the American left could be for such a scenario if it had spent more time organizing and pressuring the Democratic Party. Just as the same leftist forces that elected Evo Morales and MAS continued to protest them once in office, the left in the US should have also been demonstrating against leaders from their own ranks. Compare the Bolivian attitude to the left in the United States. American liberals, as well as leftists, were quite complacent during the Obama years, with very little organizing against their president. Even when President Obama was bombing seven countries with drone strikes, deporting millions of undocumented immigrants, or trying to ram through a corporate free trade deal with the help of the GOP, the left in the US didn't protest as vigorously as the Bolivian left did when they had Evo Morales in charge. It was only after Trump succeeded Obama that the left in the US attempted to mobilize against a leader that they had recognized as an urgent threat. But the excitement and efficiency of these protests soon became weak and disoriented and eventually fizzled out. The disappointing trend played out in various movements such as the Women's March, Black Lives Matter, and other actions that saw hundreds and thousands of participants take to the streets for progressive causes. These included the March for Science or the Pro-Gun Control March for Our Lives. However, despite initial enthusiasm and unity, all of these attempts at change eventually petered out. The lasting change they sought never materialized into concrete policy victories. If only liberals and leftists in the US were organized during the Obama years, they would have been ready to productively oppose President Trump. And the same is true today. Because American liberals and leftists didn't organize enough during the Biden years, we may not be ready to efficiently oppose an authoritarian takeover if there's an under Trump presidency. The rest of the world can learn a lot from Bolivia. It is a great irony that the country with the highest number of coup d'etats in world history now offers a model on how to restore democracy. What we can do to strengthen democracies across the globe is to follow the example of Bolivians. Not Evo Morales himself, but its grassroots left which, as I have repeated, never became complacent. They did not lionize their president and follow him with blind allegiance. Instead, they remained in a perpetual state of advocacy for their causes. By constant organizing and protesting, they maintained a structure strong enough to meet and oppose right-wing authoritarianism. It is therefore the principle of ruling by obeying that acts as the eventual safeguard for democracy. The left in the US, Europe, and elsewhere should look to Bolivia as a blueprint. It is the Bolivian attitude we must follow if we ever want a chance of organizing against a possible coup here in our own country.